I just truly enjoy a challenging course and not something that's just going to be easy. I want something that's going to make it hurt and make me earn it and really kind of put me in that place. Welcome to Running is Cheaper Than Therapy podcast. I am your host, Dr. Weta L. Brown. I inspire and promote movement. I explain how running adds to life from a mental wholeness aspect, how obstacles can be overcome in life to make it to your finish line. Welcome to Running is Cheaper Than Therapy, episode 44. Today, I have a very special guest. I know all of my guests are very special, but today is really special. I invite Max Linnell. He is the first African-American professional triathlete to earn his pro card in 2014. He was a former college soccer player. And initially, he had a big dream of going to the pros in soccer. But his dream was derailed when he suffered a major knee injury just weeks before he was set to try out for a local minor league in Philadelphia. In 2011, he stumbled upon the sport of triathlon in a coffee shop of all places. We'll talk about the significance of that later. After a year of racing, he was addicted. Now the former college soccer star dominates his competition in cycling, swimming, and running. He also is what I call a renaissance man. He dabs into a lot of different areas, which we'll talk about later. Welcome, the one and only Max Fennell to the show. Well, thanks again for joining me today. Yeah, thanks for having me. I just want to start with your, I guess, your formative years. How, what got you into sports? Uh, honestly, I was raised by a single mom that knew that she had a little rambunctious kid that was just running all over the house that she needed to figure out a way for him to expend his energy. So she put me in those Saturday soccers. And then next thing you know, I was just, you know, high school varsity, through sport varsity athlete. So you love soccer? That was your sport growing up? Yeah, for me, it was, I, I thought soccer was what it was going to be that you know, I was going to become a professional athlete in, right? Um, so I did all the travel sports teams. Uh, the tra- and, uh, you know, I did track, I did the cross, I wrestled for a little bit as well. But for me, it was always just soccer. I, I love the sport. So what made you gravitate to, to soccer versus the cross wrestling or any other sport? I think because of uh, the freedom of expression in soccer, right? There's generally, you know, it's a team sport and there's a flow to how the team's supposed to go and how you're supposed to move the ball. But generally, the position I play, which was oftentimes being a forward or attack, uh, you still have a level of freedom of expression of how to score, right? You know, you're kind of dancing with the soccer ball sometimes. I was a fast guy. So, you know, for me, it was usually like one, two touch and then I was scoring a goal. But uh, just something about soccer and and I think the endurance aspect of it, right, it, at the high school level and the collegiate level, it's a 90 minute soccer game. Right. And, you know, you're oftentimes covering like 10 miles a game. So I, I just think it just fit my type of personality. OK. And you do you got a scholarship to go to um, college for soccer? Yeah. So I, I got a uh, scholarship to go to Del Valle College and I played uh, collegiate soccer there for two years. Um, then I just kind of realized, you know, it wasn't working out for me and decided to just leave and go pursue, just get a, a basic job. And I was thinking like, all right, I'm just going to leave and go and try and become a professional soccer player. Like go try out for one of those like small sub soccer teams. So you got injured when you were in your pursuit of your professional soccer career? Yeah. So I believe at the time Philadelphia was getting ready to create the Philadelphia Union and they had, uh, again, like their B squad type of team that was created. So I was just thinking, all right, I was going to either try and go to those tryouts. I did go to like open tryouts and then I was thinking, all right, I'll, I'll go try out for like their B squad and see if I can, you know, make my way onto the team. But what happened was while I was playing, 
a pickup soccer game. I ran onto a soccer ball. I was running onto the ball and the goalkeeper came out and he slide tackled me. My knee got caught or my leg got caught. My body went one way. My knee went the other way. And, you know, pretty much. Did you tore your ACL or what injury did you sustain? I believe it was my, not my ACL. It was my, uh, I think my MCL. But it wasn't a full tear. It wasn't anything insane because I remember at that time I was doing single leg squats with a barbell. And I remember talking to the orthopedic uh, surgeon at the time and he was just saying like, yeah, I think the reason why this wasn't much more serious was because you were doing all that strength training at the time. So you didn't have to have surgery, but you had to have a significant rehab. I rehabbed myself. So that's how I got into that's how I got into triathlons, right? Because at the time, you know, I was studying exercise physiology. I was just really deep into just all of that and self rehabbing because at that point I just had so many injuries that I could just go, like I've already gone to the doctors enough times of for like sprained ankles and little kind didn't want them to send me to that basic rehab where they're going to put me up against a wall with a, with a giant ball and do basic squats with dumbbells. I'm like, nah. You know, I got to speed up the recovery process. And I knew that cycling is a really good way to strengthen your knees, right? So also, right after the injury, I was working at a coffee shop and I was hobbling around, like literally, like I think it was like a day or two after the injury. And this regular customer, his name is Brian Sullivan, who I who I always talk about, uh, he comes in, he's like, oh, what are you going to do now? And I told him, I was like, oh, well, I heard about these triathlons. <laughs> Maybe I'll go do a triathlon. Uh, go do an Ironman. He was just like, dude, like, you know, don't jump into it so quickly, especially that we live here in Philadelphia. We have an iconic race. Why don't you try out for the Philly try? And I was like, I don't have a bike. He's like, oh, well, I got an extra bike for you. And I remember I didn't take him seriously either. It wasn't until like he sent me a message. He's like, dude, I got this bike in my office. Come by and pick it up. And I remember walking around the corner to his office. And I thought it was just going to be like, my mind was just thinking it was just going to be like some beater, you know, like BMX Huffy bike. I, I really hadn't looked too much into it. And then when I saw the bike, I was like, oh my gosh, this is like a, it's like a Ferrari of a bike. This is like a real deal. What kind of bike was it? To people that were in triathlon back in the day, Elite Bicycles was a really well-known uh, bike company, and it was them, uh, Elite Bicycles from Philadelphia. So he let you borrow his bike? Yeah. So how long did you use his bike? Uh, I used it, and then he gave it to me. Oh, nice. I know. So that was what was really kind of cool was that like I had this bike, and I thought I was just going to – like. You know, it was just, I was just borrowing it and then he ended up giving it to me. So you said you wanted to do triathlon. What made you want to do triathlon? Because I know when I was growing up, I didn't know what a triathlon was. So it was not like anything that would be on my radar at the time. I went to a sports camp when I was younger and we had always done what was called like a mini Ironman, which was we would do a swim and then we would run afterwards. So I had always just known about them as a kid and then I would see him on television. So that's just how I knew about it. But it really wasn't until he told me about the Philly try, which is when I decided to like do a little bit more research into tries. It wasn't until I got hurt that I really like my mind switched over to like, all right, doing these triathlon things uh, to just kind of see what it's all about and use that as an opportunity to rehab my knee. Okay. And you say you saw it on TV, was it the Kona National Championship? No. They used to show the Ironman World Championships on NBC back in the day. Not back in the day, like 2009. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So how did you go from just wanting to participate in triathlons to actually wanting to pursue it in a professional sense? Honestly, the first year. So, so I did the first try i did the first triathlon the philly try and i got seventh in my age group and then i was like all right maybe i'll do another one and see how it goes and i don't even remember what place i got in the next one i think it was just more so like all right like i i realized i'm fast at this i can make this work let's just see are there more races that i can do and how i can get to those races and living in the Philadelphia area at the time, there's a lot of races in that area, especially at the Jersey Shore. But it wasn't until later that season when I won my age group when I was just like, oh, man, I really need to take a serious look at this and maybe consider instead of using this as, as a way of rehabbing, maybe I just need to switch and see if I can become a professional in triathlons. So did you have a coach at the time? 
so what it was was Brian was just kind of advising me of like what races to do and how to generally train. And then when I think people around me start realizing like, oh, like this, you know, this guy might be somewhat fast. Um, I started getting introduced to uh, quite a few different people and then introduced to um, the owner of Elite Bicycles, David Greenfield, who got me to a really good point. And then he introduced me to uh, a really good buddy of mine, really amazing swimmer, fearless swimmer, John Kenny, as well as at that time, Shannon Grady was my coach. So, you know, the Philadelphia community really kind of rallied around me early on in my career. And I just had all these mentors and coaches at that time. You write down 10 goals each morning. How early in the process was becoming a professional triathlete in your goal process? Yeah. So how that started was I was actually working part time at Lululemon and Lululemon is really good on employee development and they do a lot of extra things for their employees that allow you to take classes or, you know, what have you. And they have like reading book lists. So they had put us on to Brian Tracy and his book and his speaker series. And I just listened to it. And that was what really kind of opened my eyes to the power of, you know, like manifesting and, you know, just goal setting, which is, you know, things don't become serious until you write them down, right? The whole process of manifesting is, you know, it becomes thought, word, and then action, right? And the action part is writing it down. And that's what kind of tells the universe and tells yourself that you're serious. And in, in that case, I believe, I think that was, I had moved down to Florida and I had like barely any money. I was like living in the closet at the time training and working at a bike shop and i thought that if i had moved down to florida and just like ate off of breadcrumbs and just barely got by but i had a really good training season that kept my fitness going through that in march i'd be able to get my pro card early on and that would just change everything but what ended up happening is i didn't get my pro card and then you know i was just like oh my goodness like i you know i now have to move back home like like this isn't like this clearly isn't working but I was like, you know, I knew about writing my goals down and I was like, all right, you know, I think now's the time that I'm just going to get serious about this. I'm just going to write my goals down every single day until they start happening. And that's what I did. So as you write your goals down every day, 10 goals every day, were they some of the same goals? You checked them off or how, how did that process go? It's the same goals until they, until they are achieved. Sometimes it's still the same goal consistently. You can literally go back like a few years and go, oh, yeah, those things have happened. All these things have legitimately happened. Some things are still longer term and I'm always just, like, hey, how long is it going to take? But um, yeah, for the most part, generally on, on any goals list, at least five of them are getting completed and five of them are constantly being changed. So did you grow up swimming? Because I know that's an obstacle for particular people of color. Did you grow up swimming? Like what is the, I guess, the hardest part of a transitioning into triathlon what was the hardest part so for me it wasn't so much that i grew up swimming i think as i mentioned earlier i went to a sports camp so i knew how to float right i had done water skiing i knew how to like competitively swim in the sense of like do breaststroke and stuff but i had asked my friends and i think just with me having an extensive athletic background as a kid just growing up playing so many sports i bring that mindset into everything that i do so i just reach out to my friends and they showed me how to flip turn and you know i remember my friends like those first moments when i was like oh my goodness like when i used to struggle swimming 25 25 yards but yeah just early on i just was lucky to have friends just kind of show me the way and then i just really just worked at it season three we will continue the new segment called as the dog if you have any questions related to musculoskeletal injuries or musculoskeletal health, go to my website, www.weouilife.com, click on the tab voicemail, leave your voicemail, and select messages will be aired and answered on the segment. Now, back to the show. Out of the, the three disciplines in triathlon, do you have a favorite? 
You know, I honestly hate that question. <laughs> People always ask that. They're like, what's your strongest? And I'm like, you know, because that's not a really good place you want to put yourself mentally, right? You want to, you, you know, you want to think that you're strong at all three. You want to think of yourself as an endurance athlete and not like be like, oh, like here, here's my favorite. But if I was to answer that, I truly enjoy, you know, trail running, but I also enjoy riding my bike. You aspiring politician? You ran for a councilman at one time? Tough battle there, uh, running for city council in Menlo Park. But yeah, I definitely am. And I and I definitely think a lot of people need to start considering running for local government because that's where the change really happens, right? It's not it's not so much worrying about becoming a, a congressman or a senator. It's about if you can become the city council or a city councilman or the mayor because you can make local laws and those local laws can directly affect your life and other people's lives. And you got involved because it was, a, um, you wanted to do a swim program and the city was giving you problems with it. Was that, is that correct? What's interesting is you can live a drama free life, but if you go get involved in local politics, that's where you'll find all the drama. And yeah, you know, I couldn't understand why they didn't understand the need for this swim program and that's exposed a lot of issues because i live right down the street from facebook right so that's the big thing about menlo park is that facebook is right here and they do a lot for the community but you know we have significant issues going on in our community where you know essentially one part of the community is neglected and i was just like why do we not have a program where we provide free swim lessons and i here's a program for that and then when your city council's being like well we don't really see the the benefit of that then you start being like uh, who are you people and what's really going on here? <laughs> and then you wake up to what's going on in your local government and then uh, it's time to get to work and make some changes. So were you able to get that program? No. <laughs> well, ironically, what is happening is now that whole center is being renovated. So I want to be in a situation to help run the pool, right? You can put a proposal in to see if you can run the pool. They have this gorgeous pool over there. But since it's, if I can be honest, the black and brown area, you know, people treat it like it's bad. But if you're, if you were a swimmer and I showed you this pool, it's a 25 meter pool, right? That barely anyone was swimming at, right? As a swimmer, you're like, uh, show me where that pool is at. I'll go there all yeah, the time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you also involved in archery. I see your Instagram posts and I always think of Hunger Games when I see you out there. So <laughs> <I know. archery>. <laughs> <laughs> Well, so I recently got into hunting and I know that's going to be an interesting conversation for a lot of people because people, people view hunting as one way. But what hunting has done for me is it's really helped me kind of discover who I am and my heritage. You know, I always thought one thing and next thing you know, I found out like I'm actually indigenous to America, right? And there's actually a lot of black people that don't realize that they're actually indigenous to America. Not all black people came over on slave ships, right? And then when I understand that history and heritage, it's like, all right, I want to get more involved with the process. And that's why I like bow hunting because it takes a lot of skill. I think more endurance athletes that care about where their food comes from would enjoy bow hunting because 99% of the time, you're literally just going for a hike with your bow. Hunting television shows make you think that people are just out in the wilderness killing things. And that's just not, that's not at all. It's, it takes a lot of hard work and it's really hard, especially in California because we have public land. So it's like, you know, I'm going hunting this Saturday. What I'm going to do is I'm going to literally drive to the middle of nowhere, park my car, hope my car stays all right. And then just dip off into the wilderness. Hope I don't get lost and hopefully I don't get eaten by a bear and that's you know really how it goes down but it's also it's a really good meditation and it's a really good way for me to get easy miles on my legs because the archery range by my that i go to it's about like two to three miles long so it takes me about anywhere from 90 minutes to three hours to complete the whole thing generally on average 90 minutes just to do 14 targets because it's like hilly terrain but archery is an art form right as well as that's how our people right that's what we've done for thousands upon thousands of years is we always had a bow in our hand so just watch what happens just put a bow back in your hands and watch what happens like i don't really need to explain it you'd be like oh this just seems so natural to me nice so you do a lot of hunting hiking 
exploring. I read that you sometimes you go hiking like in the middle of the night. Well, so it's not so much hiking in the middle of the night. It's more so when if you want to be like a real hunter, it's like I go like camp in the back country and then okay. wake, and then like I wake up at like two a.m. like eat and then I'm like hiking on the trail at four a.m. And the thing is, like, that's just like predator hour so it's like you know especially when i'm when i'm doing this by myself like I, it's it's a really big adrenaline rush but it's also extremely nerve-wracking because you can literally just come around the corner and there could just be a bear right there or a mountain lion or a coyote or a bobcat or a rattlesnake you're usually by yourself when you do this yeah well unless it's spring or fall my dog's with me but generally i'm, I'm going by myself how did you learn about how to deal with bears, coyotes, and other wildlife? I think that just goes back to me just going down the understanding my genealogy and understanding how my family's always been connected to the land. My, I know my grandfather was an avid hunter, but then it's just, just studying as well as being honest, like a lot of it just is instinct right and that's how i know i'm supposed to be doing it it's like no one's taught me how to track animals but i can track animals without even trying and like i've honestly said it's almost like avatar-ish where it looks like the ground is like glowing for me i can just see where animals are going and moving and coming from where sometimes you can't see it i just think that's just what happens when you get out into the wilderness in this way because hunting's not always about, you know, going after the game. It's also about observing, right? It's going, like, sometimes I climb a ridgeline and I'm looking, like, off, you know, into the distance. And I'm just watching and just seeing how everything goes and just knowing how the terrain changes. You're also an uh, entrepreneur. Tell me about um, your business. Yeah, I started at Fen Coffee two years ago. Uh, we've been growing ever since. Obviously, COVID kind of slowed us down just a tad bit. But I was very lucky enough to be introduced to a gentleman who's had a coffee farm in his family for five generations. And this gentleman knows just some of the most amazing coffee farm farmers across the world. And he's introduced me to them. That has just allowed us to have direct coffee relationships and providing very premium coffee. Like I'm still pretty confident no one's selling Yemen coffee. And Yemen coffee is very, very expensive. Uh, it's very premium. And uh, the Yemen coffee that we sell comes from a woman-owned farm. And they call her the Queen of Mocha because uh, she's such a legend. And her coffee is just so amazing. I heard, I guess, your interest in the coffee business started with your um, desire to get, I guess, better, higher quality products during training to give you that caffeine without giving GI issues as a lot of the products out there for athletes are made of sugar and cause a lot of GI issues. Well, so what it was is, is yeah, so I used to drink all those energy drinks. And, you know, if you've ever gone for a long endurance bike ride, anything over four hours, right? If you take something at hour two, right, that can make or break how that ride's going to go. And oftentimes I would have those energy drinks and it would just make me feel all gunky and stuff. And then uh, when I moved out here, that's when I discovered cold brew. And I was wondering, and I, and I noticed that it didn't really upset my stomach and it, it's much cleaner. So I was wondering if you took espresso beans if there's a way you can make a, a cold brew a certain way that it would just be so highly uh, caffeinated, but wouldn't upset your stomach. And I just, you know, tinkered with it, came up with a bunch of different recipes, got the roast correct. And I know Khadija, she really likes them, likes our espresso shots. I know other athletes have had them during their races and ha have had successful races. I think it's the how the beans are roasted and the method of how we make the cold brew, how we filter the cold brew, all that together just makes it so that you drink it. And next thing you know, you just got this second win and you're just crushing it. Has it been hard for you to train during the pandemic? Uh, for me, not really, because I switched over and started doing the bow hunting thing, and that's opened up a lot of opportunities. I was actually down in Texas hunting for a hunting television show. So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just spending all that time in the backcountry has really kept my endurance. I just did Escape from Alcatraz. Even though I wasn't mentally there, I was just like, oh, man, I'm so fit right now, <laughs> right? Opposed to 
you know how you can sometimes think about the swim distance and being like, oh my gosh, it just seems so long, or you just feel like the race is going to be so long, or you're getting ready to get off the bike and you're like, oh my gosh, I have to go run this distance. Am I going to even make that? Mm-hmm. I didn't have any of that. I was just mm-hmm. like, all right, I got to go bike. <laughs> I got to, I'm swimming. I'm going to mm-hmm. get through this swim. And okay. not, not once was I like, like, I can't do this swim or I can't do this bike or I can't do this run. And everything I was doing, I was strong in and I wasn't cramped. Nothing felt like it was broken. And that is a really good place to be if you want to build on some fitness because that just means you're in shape and you can get stronger off of that. That was your first race since, what, 19? Yeah, that was my – and that's I think that's also the other issue. It's been my first race since 2019. The other other competition I did was the Spartan Games. So how did you get interested in Spartan? And I know you were on a television show too, right? Um, Million Dollar Man? It was Million Dollar Mile first th- – that I think people in the OCR world discovered who I was. And then honestly, it was the folks from, so it was the person that casted me, uh, Kevin. It was actually two Kevins, the producer Kevin. And then there was, uh, the Spartan athlete who was also working with the show, Kevin, Kevin Donahue, that kind of whispered in my ear. And the next thing you know, I had the CEO of Spartan sending me a message on LinkedIn. <laughs> about offering me a Spartan leadership uh, ticket. So we went to a Spartan leadership event and then just all these people just kept whispering in my ear. And just, I think the icing on the cake was having Joe DeSena reach out to me and offer me to do some Spartan races. And just, I was like, Oh, okay. Yeah. This, this community seems pretty dope. So how, how many races have you done in the Spartan? I can only go off of like, I guess, like successful races. So I know I podium at a Spartan stadium race. So I got first and my second Spartan stadium race. I did, I got fourth overall at a half trail at a Spartan trail. And that's, yeah, that's the only two. So I think I'm probably at like five, eight races in that range somewhere. Around there. And you enjoy the experience with Spartan. You just like, you like the community and the races. I don't understand why more triathletes aren't doing Spartan races because it's this, you, it's really the same training. Your, your training's not going to get affected. You just really need to add in a little bit more upper body strength and your ability to do like monkey bar stuff. But it's just a nice way to cross train. It's a very welcoming, encouraging community. It's yeah, yeah. it's where it's where triathlon used to be before triathlon got to where it is now. And what do you mean by that? Triathlon just used to be more about like it's hardcore. Like we're going to show up. We don't even know if you're going to be able to make the swim or not. <laughs> and, you know, this is like a brutal course, right? That's what Escape from Alcatraz is. It's known for being like an adventure race. You know, mm-hmm. you don't know what's going to be thrown at you. Now there's a lot of races where they're just mundane. They're out and back. It's in a lake. It's out and back. And then there's drafting and stuff like that. And people are taking it a little bit too serious opposed to the camaraderie. And at Spartan races, you just see a lot more like laughing, joking and cheering going on and less like, ah, you know, going straight, going forward. It's just, yeah, more fun. But we're still taking it seriously, but it's just like, there's just a different energy. Uh, Kate from Alcatraz, what made you sign up for that race? You've done it a few times, correct? Well, so it's not so much I sign up. It's actually I get invited to the race. Okay. Okay. Yeah, but you so. can say no if you didn't want to do it, though. <laughs> yeah. I honestly thought that possibly was going to happen in this race where I committed and then thought I was going to back out of it. Uh, but then I ultimately ended up racing this year as my fourth time doing Escape from Alcatraz. So what made you say yes? What drew me to Escape from Alcatraz? I like that it's a challenging course. I like that I knew that the swim is just extremely unpredictable and you just, you don't know. Like I've now done, done it where one year the swim was canceled. One year the swim was extremely fast. Second year, decently fast. And this year it was like extremely, extremely slow. I just truly enjoy a challenging course and not something that's just going to be easy. I want something that's going to make it hurt and make me earn it and really kind of put me in that place. Even though, right, for this race, I wasn't like I wasn't mentally there. I still was enjoying the fact that I wasn't mentally there, but I still showed up anyway. So is the hardest part of that race, would you say, is to, to swim? I know it's 
as far as the the swim was what it's close to like half Ironman distance, but the bike and the um the run are shorter. Jumping off the boat into the water and you don't know if it's gonna be choppy is usually traditionally a hard swim from what I've heard. Yeah, it's the reason why the swim is so hard is because the timing of that swim is when the tide is heading out. And when the tide's heading out, you just that's just so much water exiting the bay that the chop can be just so insane. As well as with Alcatraz being that there, people had escaped, but apparently they didn't make it. Because if you do that swim during the winter, I mean, that's like 50 degrees. That water is generally always cold. So, I mean, if someone was trying to escape from Alcatraz and they didn't have a wetsuit and, you know, you've been in harsh conditions, I mean, that's going to be a really, really, really tough swim. The best advice I can give to people if they ever find themselves in choppy waters, don't be afraid to breaststroke when you get in those swells. I think we just, you, you keep, sometimes the swells can just pass you by and then the water can, water will calm down and you can swim from the swim. Okay. Can you tell my listeners, I guess, how the process is to get to go pro as far as track? How do how do people get their pro cards? I don't know. I don't know the process of getting your pro card now. I heard that the process is much easier now than it used to be. Uh, but I would just direct people to go to the Elite Triathlon webpage. I've maintained my my professional license. When I got it, you could you just had to place top three overall at a pro qualifying race. And, I, and I'm pretty sure that the, the rules are a little bit more relaxed now just due to COVID and stuff. So how do you maintain it? You just have to qualify at certain races and just keep your pro license. So you do a lot of um, uh, mentoring. Um, I know when I met you, you were in Chicago um, with the program that basically getting African-American youth involved in triathlons. Can you tell me about some of the other things you participate in? That's Bernard Lyle's group, TriMasters out of Chicago. And I think he's got the longest program going around. I believe he told me his 30th anniversary is coming up either this year or next. Uh, so that's TriMasters with um, Bernard Lyles out of Chicago. But right now, I started United Endurance Project, which is we're working to diversify starting lines. We want to advocate for the up-and-coming generations and up-and-coming athletes that want to go pro in endurance sports. And we just need to start getting a little bit louder. A lot of companies came out and said that, oh, we're going to make all these changes and we're going to support athletes. And they really didn't do anything. And it's very important that if those companies aren't going to do anything, that we start doing something about it. So I started United Endurance Project to start kind of addressing the lack of diversity at in the programs. So there's been a lot of talk about mental health in regards to athletes in, in sports. Do you find sometimes it's difficult to stay stay focused as far as not getting burnt out? And what do you do personally? Yeah, I've thought about that. And a lot of people have said to me that, oh, you've handled it so well. And I just think it's because of my personality. And literally that when things shut down, I just, I kept going outside. And then <laughs> I remember just thinking like my work around to the shutdowns was, that's why I got my hunting license. If I could just speak towards, you know, black and brown and indigenous folks to the Americas. There's just something that happens to us when we get outside in the wilderness. Sometimes I go sit by a tree. Sometimes when I'm hunting, I sleep outside. <laughs> I take a nap underneath a tree. You just don't understand how healing it is being outside in the wilderness, sleeping outside underneath the stars. That's where we come from, right? I just think that something's going on with us being in front of all this social media and putting priorities around the wrong things rather than our happiness and what feeds our soul and what feeds my soul is being outside so i want to do anything i can to spend as much time outside as possible as well as when you're outside that's that's also like movement meditation right like going for a hike can be movement meditation you can walk and chant right or you can walk and really emphasize situational awareness whereas you're just paying attention to your breath and every step right those things really just kind of help you center yourself whereas 
I think sometimes we just get so consumed that we lose our happiness, whereas you should be doing everything for your happiness, right? And if it doesn't sit with your soul, I don't think you should be sitting in that. I think you should be doing everything that pleases your soul. I agree. I agree. If a present day Max could go back and talk to yourself when you were a child, what would you tell yourself? <sighs> Slow down <laughs> and uh, think before you act. And I would say keep moving forward. So <laughs> it's going to work out. Like even when you don't think it's going to work out, I'm telling you to keep moving forward because it's going to work out. Great words of advice. Keep it moving. Can you share with me and my listeners? Like what's what's next for you? Like what's in the upcoming season, the rest of the season and next year? Oh, well, so other endeavors, I'm focused on trying to get Fenton Coffee's coffee bar up and running. So it's monitoring the situation, trying to find a space to open that, get Fenton Coffee into a hundred different stores wholesale. Competing wise, we've got the Spartan Golden Gate half marathon trail in November that I've really been focused on. I really want to start doing more trail racing. Triathlons, uh, I really enjoy racing in California. So we have some races in Santa Cruz that I'm really focused on racing. I want to be an advocate for real indigenous hunting, you know, for indigenous people getting back to their roots to indigenous, indigenous black Americans getting back to their outdoor roots. There's going to be a lot more opportunities coming my way in the outdoor space. So I really hope to start representing getting people out into the outdoors in that capacity as well. Where can people find you? Uh, you can find me at Max Fennell on your social media platforms, as well as Fen Coffee, fencoffee.com. So any last minute words of advice and inspiration for my listeners? Write down your goals and keep after them until you achieve them. Don't stop focusing on your goals until you achieve them. But if you don't want that goal, it's fine to let it go and move on to another one, right? But just keep moving forward those things that really get your soul moving. Right words of advice. Well, thank you for joining me today. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. That wraps up this episode of Running is Cheaper Than Therapy podcast. Thank you for tuning in. If you already haven't, please download Running is Cheaper Than Therapy podcast on Apple, Spotify, or however you listen to your favorite podcast. If you have any questions, concerns, or possible show topics, Please email Run It Is Cheaper Than Therapy, OLB, Omaha Love Brown. Again, that's Run It Is Cheaper Than Therapy, Omaha Love Brown at gmail.com. I also can be reached via Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube. Handle We Life, We Love, OUI Life, OUI Love. Thank you, and please tune in again.